I hadn't under, had really planned this part, but uh, today's uh, uh, early reading in one year Bible was uh, included James 1, 19 to 27. And uh, verse 27 is already in your material, but uh, uh, I thought the whole passage kind of spoke to pastoral visiting in a way. Uh, there's certain elements that kind of stand out in relation to what we're going to be talking about. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Of course, you'd never do that in a pastoral visit. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. We're going to talk about that a little bit, how you introduce the word, like scripture, God's promises, God's uh, pledges of hope into the conversation. But don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So I was talking with somebody that had had open heart surgery and was convalescing, and they were talking about what a blessing it was to have people come and and stay up to 10 minutes. Beyond that wasn't so much a blessing, but mm -hmm. the short stays were very welcome and really uh, helped this person through uh, that period of illness. And the, the setting free, like if you get in pain and you get staring at a blank wall and you're all by yourself, you can get lonely and depressed. It's not a very happy place to be. But, uh, visiting and bringing God's word into the situation can help set them free from that um, sad situation. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, hmm, that's what, something you might want to do in your visit, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Caring for widows in their distress. If someone has lost a husband and fight to cancer or what have you. Uh, that's a big role for pastoral visiting there too, caring for them in their distress. And that, James says that's pure and genuine religion. That's putting your faith into action, showing Jesus' love to others. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you will humbly plant it in us. And, um, not just let us hear it, but also put it into action. Thank you, Lord, for this group of people that are keen to do that tonight. Uh, we thank you for Jesus' love for us shown on the cross and the way that you help us to care for others when they're in distress and they're in need. And Lord, uh, help us to be your hands and feet in this hurting world. In Christ's name. So that's all bonus. Now on with the PowerPoint. So a little bit of background, uh, promoting caring and connecting it here in chapel. Uh, back in early September, Pastor Phil asked our, our staff and Chair Gary Lyle from the board to do a little brainstorming about what that might look like. Um, uh, and uh, so we came up with uh, something like this to provide care for those who are sick at home or in the hospital, grieving or needing routine pastoral care visitation under the leadership of pastoral staff and the caring and connecting coordinator. Uh, you, you know that our, we're looking at downsizing a little bit in staff, and, but there's also a huge role for volunteers in this kind of area of ministry. And, so it, and, and some of you are honestly doing this already. It's just, it's not organized in that. And so we'd, we'd like to uh, capitalize on God's gifts in you that you already have that passion and just do it a little more uh, perhaps methodically or uh, systematically. So responsibilities for people in this caring and connecting group uh, might look like this. Meet up to three times a year with the caring and connecting coordinator in conjunction with pastoral staff to receive training and determine visitation priorities for upcoming weeks. So that's why you're here tonight, just getting some training. Uh, what are, how's, what's this going to look like? What are some do's and don'ts when you, you do some pastoral visiting? 
conduct pastoral visits beginning with visitation of the sick and shut-ins. Uh, that's kind of phase one in the rollout and if you get comfortable with that and if you're hankering for doing even more uh, with eventual expansion to other people groups associated with our congregation. Families, single parents, those who are financially stressed, might have uh, people with particular financial bent that can help coach them through some budgeting and that sort of thing in the home. Uh, contact the Caring and Connecting Coordinator by phone or email regularly to report visit summaries or tracking in the church database. It's called Elvanto, but that's just the name of the database uh, system we're using. But we can make notes and everybody on staff can see that and see, oh, if there's a problem over here that has we need more pastoral care from the staff is warranted, then we can do that. Um, also, that helps us kind of keep track of who's, who's been the longest since they got visited, and so that kind of brings them up to the front, to the top of the list. That, so we, we hope to visit people on a fairly regular basis that way. Alerting them if further visitation by a member of the pastoral staff is particularly warranted. And keep alert for opportunities to bless others, whether by themselves or by referral to someone apt in the here in Chapel Church family. For example, help with yard work, putting in somebody's wood, cleaning, travel, grocery assistance from the Benevolent Fund. We do have a Benevolent Fund, and you heard uh, Rick say uh, Sunday the elders passed the, the policy part of it, and there's certain stages depending on how much the, the request is for. Um, but there is a benevolent fund for helping people in time of need. So you can help be your eyes and ears knowing what, what the needs are in the congregation. And feel free to raise your hand if you've got questions or want to ask clarification. <coughs> I'm just kind of rambling on following the points here. Now confidentiality is a huge priority. You've heard the saying, what happens in Jamaica stays in Jamaica or uh, anyway. Loose lips sink ships was a key phrase in Britain during wartime. Um, and if you want to develop trust and people having confidence in the visitor or in the church, that trust evaporates when what was shared in confidence gets broadcast around. They start hearing it third hand. Oops, that's a major no-no. Um, before sharing something with a third party, ask yourself, would person A want me to be talking about this without them here? So we're kind of respecting their feelings. Uh, what is it that they have given us permission to share? Otherwise, we need to respect their right to that information. Proverbs 11.13. Can we read this one together? Whoever goes about slandering or reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. We want to be the, the second category. In Proverbs 17.9, let's read this. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Uh, you've maybe, hopefully, well, not had that happen to you too much, but if you have, you know it hurts when people have gossiped or spread things that you didn't want them to be spreading around. Now, some spiritual considerations for visitation ministry. Why even bother to visit? James 1.27, and this refers to your New Minus Visitation Handbook, which you can also find online in the PDF version. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I cheaped out and I printed it off in small print, two sheets to a page. I will gladly print you another copy if you find it hard to read, but uh, it's for you to take home and, and digest. And There's a lot of good stuff in there. I'm not uh, <coughs> using a lot of material from that, but there are good points that that's a, a church in Nova Scotia has developed. And thanks to Melody for pointing, pointing out that resource to us. James 1.27 is that caring for the orphans and widows in their distress verse. And John 13, 34 and 35, which I, I hope, hi Dale, come on in. Uh, I hope some of you know by heart uh, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if, what? If you love one another. So this is as basic as it gets, being a Christian is uh, caring for people, going to see them in their time of need. And Matthew 25, 34, a very famous passage, the sheep and the goats. And the king will say to those in his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. 
Or I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And of course, they're stunned. They don't know, when did we do this for you, Lord? He says, and the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. So uh, yeah, you may think nobody knows that you went to visit so-and-so, but God knows, and the Lord will reward you, and he, he sees what you're doing. He sees how you're putting that care into practice. When we visit the sick, we are serving Christ. We are being his hands and feet. And uh, uh, Mother Teresa and the face of the dying people in Calcutta saw the, uh, Christ's face in disguise, I think is how she put it. Following the vulnerable, Christianity, following Jesus' example, places value upon the individual person as created in God's image. In the hospital setting, the patient has much of his or her dignity stripped. If you've been in a hospital, you kind of know it's a, a humbling situation. Pastor or visitor can or ought to enhance the patient's sense of self-worth, build them up and kind of give them some confidence and some cheer. Manipulation of patients in their vulnerable state, weakened physical, mental, and emotional condition, not to mention those embarrassing, flimsy, drafty hospital gowns, <laughs> is to be avoided. So be very gentle with people when they're in an especially vulnerable state, like in, in the hospital. Incarnational visiting is still kind of looking at the spiritual aspect. Why are we doing this? Uh, Incarnation or enfleshment, if you look at the kind of Latin roots of the word, means that God is with us. It's Emmanuel. We're coming up to Christmas time, we're going to be talking about God with us. Matthew 28 20, Jesus said, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So when you're going to be with the person, you are bringing, you're coming in Christ's name on behalf of the church, and you are kind of uh, bringing a sense of his presence with you, hopefully. We minister to others in the spirit and power of Jesus. And you've been, hopefully got the way of Jesus sayings resonating with, in you. I, I've begun to follow Jesus and I'm depending upon the spirit of Jesus in my journey. And as we go, well, we may not know person B from the hole in the ground, but they're in hospital and they, they should be visited, so... Lord, here I go, I'm depending on you, and I'm going to depend on you to help me know what to say and how to pray with them if they're open to that, and that sort of thing. We church folk are Jesus' body to this world. A couple of scripture references we won't read there, but that's uh, basically Jesus being the head of the body. We are to see with the eyes of God. We are to look beyond the obvious, kind of what's happening underneath here. We must read what's not being shown. Look through the masks that hide real fears and apprehensions. Um, some of us are very good at being very stoic about things and uh, not letting our real feelings be known or trying to be tough, even though we're really hurting inside. So you kind of need to be sensitive to maybe what's not being uh, revealed in their face that way. Our seeing goes beyond the human to a divine understanding. 2 Corinthians 5.16, Paul writes, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. With the Holy Spirit's help, we can kind of discern some of the other elements at work. We are to hear with the ears of God. And there's a quote from Neville Kirkwood. Beneath the talk and sometimes stoic front, there are muted cries, cries that are not audible yet are punishingly real to the patient or family members. These cries are not to be heard except by the ears of a God-inspired carer. Uh, there's a real role here for the right question at the right time. And it kind of gives the permission, the person permission to open up and share what they might not otherwise bring up on their own. But, uh, to know you are heard adds healing and comfort. Allow the patient or family members to, to open up to you. Don't force it. You're not in there with a crowbar saying, no, you got to tell them, spill your guts. No, but you're just creating a safe environment that they can trust you and they feel that, yeah, this person really cares. I can tell them things that maybe I wouldn't tell just ordinary staff or whatever. Hear their honest cries. Allow them to share their fears with you. 
don't shut them off because you don't want to hear. Sometimes you're going to hear unpleasant stuff or things that surprise you or family members are, aren't really the way they portray themselves at church or whatever. you got to be ready for that and uh, be praying, Lord, help me to, to bear this and to know what to do with this and not to use it wrongly or uh, uh, turn against people because of what you hear. Listening with the ears of God brings relief to the sufferer. Listening is the key to true pastoral care. If you're there with an agenda to fill the silences by talking about what's going on in your life, it's probably not the right ministry for you. You kind of have to be comfortable with a little bit of silence that kind of allows them... I, I, I'm an introvert, for example. And if I'm at a table with three or four fairly extrovert people, I might not get a word in edgewise because I'm always waiting for that little gap. and. Sometimes that little gap never comes because they're always talking on top of each other. So sometimes you kind of have to be able to just let there be a little bit of silence and be comfortable with that you know, for, to be for the person who volunteer or something. And speak with the voice of God. Everyone that's been called by God to minister to others knows when this happens. You can have some real surprising God moments. After you've observed with the eyes of God and listened with the ears of God, you're then able to speak with the voice of God. God will speak through you. It's God's voice the patient or family needs to hear more so than yours. And they will hear that through what you say, through the contact. And it may be they're hearing things between your lines as well, but just that you care, you're really concerned for them, and you're, you're there to support them. It's God's voice that soothes, encourages, motivates, provides, and maintains hope. Be aware of the Spirit's prompting. It's depending on the Spirit of Jesus in my journey. Use His Word in Scripture. Share a passage. Maybe you've been doing your devotions and something's been speaking with you. Uh, hopefully it's, it's something that touches you and genuinely and not just kind of mechanical out there, but you're relating something to yourself and in that giving of yourself uh, that's pretty precious to the other person because not everybody does that. There are pamphlets as well like I carry in my briefcase uh, Canadian Bible Society scripture pamphlets. They've got a nice picture on the front and some um, not a lot of scripture inside but a few kind of encouraging uh, passages that are, are nice to leave with patients. They also double will talk a little bit later what if the patient's sleeping or that, then you can at least leave something and write a little note on it or whatever. It shows that you've been there. Um, respect the patient. The patient may feel, some of you have been in the hospital, you know how this feels. Exposed, useless, a burden, threatened. Healthcare is pretty scary. All those pokes, all those tests. What's, what are they going to say with the outcome of that uh, treatment? Uh, what the patient needs, restoration of self-respect. Allowed to do things for themselves. Sometimes you can try and do too much. Uh, it's, it's good for them to do a little bit of the exercise for themselves. And, uh, to be reassured. Acceptance as they are. And respect feel cared for, not abandoned. And uh, you know, Melody has uh, graciously agreed to start off in this coordinator role and uh, we really appreciate her gifts that way. And she's going to talk a little bit more about the kind of planning and tracking and I know she's got some other points to share. Melody? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, this gives a little break from my voice as well. Oh, okay. Well, thank you all for coming. It's uh, great to see actually as many as there are out tonight. That's wonderful. I really didn't know how many would be showing up, so it was nice to hear from Pastor Ernest today that there was uh, at least 13 that were able to come tonight and a couple more that um, wanted to be here, but we'll see this at another time where we can talk otherwise. So, um, for those that don't know who I am, I don't think there's <laughs> Melody Wallace. Um, so, I just wanted to touch on the uh, handout that you have. I'm going to be touching on a few points that I find so important in this ministry. 
and uh, you'll be able to read it at home a little bit further. Um, but what does visitation mean? And in this, um, Pastor Steve Mills actually points it out as being personal visitation is an intentional direct encounter with um, by an individual with another person for the purpose of getting to know them, understanding and addressing their needs, and providing encouragement and assistance in the name of Jesus, and expressing through word and or deed the constant love and care of God. I thought that was a pretty profound statement to cover the whole realm of what visitation ministry is really about. So to give you some personal um, background about myself, because some of you know who I am, but most of you don't really know me, except for maybe Grace and Roland, because they've known me since I was, well, a little bit younger. <laughs> maybe 18 or 19. <laughs> if you didn't know that, I've uh, known them for a long time. Of course, my husband. There's really nothing more he needs to know. <laughs> Everything's out there, so that's good. <laughs> Um, so I was born 40-some years ago, 40-plus years ago, and uh, I grew up as a pastor's kid, if you didn't know that. At the ripe old age of two, I started my visitation ministry, actually, because I used to go with my dad <laughs> on pastoral visits, and uh, especially to the nursing homes, and uh, it was uh, pretty impressed. Uh, it was impressed on me, even at a young age, how um, visitation was so important to those that you went to see. Um, now, back then, when I was about two or three, I looked like Shirley Temple because I had curly, curly blonde hair, ringlets, and chubby cheeks, which I kind of still have. Um, but uh, um, I have vivid memories of going with him into the nursing homes. And although he was a Protestant pastor, he was asked to visit um, a lot of the Catholic nursing homes, actually. Um, which was interesting. So by the time I was three, I was known to all the nuns in the Catholic nursing home. <laughs> so you can imagine a three-year-old, when we arrived at the nursing home, um, these nuns would know we were coming and they just run towards me with their habits flying, the black and white, <laughs> I still see it, um, to take me from my dad. And they would take me around to different rooms, and my dad would go visiting where he needed to go. But there was no plan to protect back then. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, I, I still vividly remember that so much. So my, my thing was I had to sing Jesus Loves Me to every person that we went to see, that they took me around to see. Um, but I was paid in cookies and juice, so it didn't really matter to me. <laughs> I probably didn't sing very well, but uh, it really didn't matter. Um, it, was, it was just a, a really great memory that hmm. I will always have. Um, so being in a pastor's family, in our pastor's family, in my family, um, that meant that weekly we usually had families from the congregation in our home, either for a meal or after evening service, if you remember evening services, way back when, um, for dessert and coffee or tea. Uh, and that was normal, And or else we were invited to other people's homes, right? So 20 years ago, that's what we did. There was no small groups. We just got together and had a good time of fellowship. Um, as well at Christmas or important holidays in our home, it wasn't just our family around the table. We often always had at least one or two extras at our table, which were shut-ins or people that didn't have family. So that was just a normal thing that we grew up with. And, uh, you know, I never thought of it as anything different before. But um, now I look back at it and I think those people that were around that table, probably that meant the world to them to be included in a family, right? So again, it's just um, a great legacy that uh, I have. Um, so jump ahead a few years before I was married. I was working full time as an administrator at a busy church in Milton, Ontario. I led the young adult group. I was leader of the youth group, one of the leaders. <laughs> you guys know this, I was very busy. Um, I was also, what was I doing? I was a deacon, and I was also in charge of uh, leading the prison ministry at the Milton Penitentiary there. So I was like early 20s doing all this. Um, but it really was a great basis for a lot of things in life, right? Before I had 
before I met my husband, before I had children, um, I was able to experience all these different things and get training, much like we're doing tonight. Um, all the deacons had to have this training, which was mm -hmm. pretty neat. Um, so yeah, so that was uh, just one of the things that uh, part of my life that I did. But uh, then, much to my pastor's dismay, Boris came along. <laughs> and yeah, it all changed. He took me from a very busy lifestyle in a very busy place to a farm in Huron County. So <laughs> it was quite, quite the change for me. Um, but it is true, as you'll read in there, that the simple act of connecting with others where they're at is filled with uh, powerful possibilities for connection. Um, the act of love and friendship creates trust, value, and incredible uh, potential for ministry. Visitation lets people know you care and allows us as visitors to use our gifts to them, for them, and with them. This is common sense caring for the basic human um, need. It's showing God's love to others, right? So perhaps not everyone wants a visit. But those that do need a visit will be loved and cared for in a special way, as you'll read. Um, as visitors, we also have the potential to meet other family members when we're in hospital rooms or nursing home rooms or even at home. Um, and we can connect with um, those people because maybe they have no connection to Christ or to the church, right? So we are that um, blessing and that uh, that just connection to show the visitor to show those people that we're visiting in love and uh, coming in um, as a great witness for, for Christ when we do that. The idea of caring for one another is absolutely not new. We know this. It's a big biblical commandment. Care for those with needs. Care for the widows. Care for the orphans. Care for the people who are homeless. Um, there are special needs in our church, special, special situations. We know that. Things pop up. Things come around, right? Um, but we always have to be on the lookout for those circumstances. Because when people are down, um, we are challenged to get alongside of them and lift them up, right? Mm -hmm. And care and love um, them and embrace, embrace them as well. And... Um, it's true that uh, that's really what visitation ministry is all about. It's really coming alongside people, loving them where they are at. We can't change the situation, but we can show love in every situation that there is, really. Um, Matthew 25, verse 40 is one that I absolutely love, and it's in your um, package tonight as well. And it says, And the king will reply, Tell you the truth, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Here Jesus is saying, whenever you meet need, you meet me. Wherever you serve those in need, you serve me. We have been motivated by our love for Jesus, which says, Lord, wherever there is a need, lead me to it and help me to meet it as if I were meeting you. Take that in and really embrace it because that is powerful. Um, we need to daily seek the Lord's leadership so that when a need arises, we actually see it. <laughs> Sometimes we don't see it, right? We're all guilty of that. There's things going on, it's busy, and sometimes we don't see the need. But we really need to ask God daily to, to lead us and show us that need. Um, for the Christian, service to human need is service to Jesus. So the vision then becomes uh, to deeply love and care for one another in the long term by meeting needs and through prayer. So as a committee, as a team, um, we're really just coming alongside the servant committee as well, right? They are doing a fantastic job in what they're doing. And uh, Laura's still going to be the frontline person in the office that's going to hear about needs that arise. So I will be working with her um, and your team pretty closely just to make sure that um, the communication lines are open. <laughs> And if you hear, if any of you that actually want to be on this team hear of needs, um, we need to know, like, I need to know that as well, just so that we can make sure that we're meeting those needs and uh, in the proper way and in the proper time frame as well. So um, just a little bit about how it's, a little bit about how it's going to work. It's still evolving. I'm still tweaking things in my brain. <laughs> but um, what we're going to do is we will have a list of, well, there's shut-ins that we know of in the, in the church that can't get out. Um, there's others that are, are 
well, that will be like our hospital visits. Um, there's um, well things that come along that we just don't know, but when they come along, we'll we'll address them. But um, and then there's just the general church as well. Like when I'm talking about fellowship, um, it's not just for seniors and shut-ins and uh, those in the hospital, look around at the people in the congregation. That's where we need to connect with people, right, as well, just to open your home, mm -hmm. even. Um, take them for a coffee, but really just try to, to show that fellowship and connection is a great um, basis to go from. But I did come up with um, just a little thing, that, uh, just a folder that we have, and uh, right now we have, is it 60 plus? About that, I okay, think. Um, uh, the congregants, um, there are about 60 plus um, in this file folder. And uh, what we do is if when we assign people or couples or whatever to go and visit, then this is going to be either upstairs or with me, one or the other. But what we're asking is you just go into the file, it's all um, alphabetized. And after you go and visit somebody, we want you to kind of jot down if there's any um, thing that you need to relate about your visit, basically, right? So if there's a need that arose or anything in particular that you think um, a pa like the pastor's, pastoral staff should know about, then um, everybody has their own sheet. It's, it's dated. You, go, you just put the date you visited. Um, who visited, because I won't know, <laughs> unless you write down who visit you, your name, and then any notes, and then you just put it back into this folder, and then I will be able to update this every couple of weeks in the Alvanto system, mm -hmm. so that we keep up to date um, for everybody that is being looked after, um, who, who are we missing, so we'll kind of know that as well. Um, then we have pastoral staff too, that if there's a pastoral um, visit that needs to be done, they, we need to know about it so it can be done, right? And so that nothing is being missed or overlooked. Um, so that's, that's the main part of it, is just really communication. This is all this is about, this little file folder. So if you don't, um, if you don't want, like that's just one way to do it, or else you can call me or text me mm -hmm. or message me. It really doesn't matter. I will get your message or I'll get your call or call you back and just relay to me what um, is going on with that visit that you went on mm -hmm. and uh, stuff like that. So we will be, you know, getting into that a little bit more um, in the next little while, just kind of looking at who are the top priority right now and then who is the best, who's going to be the, a good fit to go and visit those people, I believe is what we're, um, we're, we're looking at doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, any questions right now? <laughs> my, my first thought was email because it would be easy for Melody to cut and paste into Alvanto because there's a place for notes right in Alvanto, but I got realizing, well, not everybody's email or typing friendly, so no. without the, the hard copy, you could at least uh, do some notes there. And even if it's nothing too significant, just the, the date and who visited and yep. had a good visit or something short like that, that, that helps us track that people did have pastoral care. But it'll also be a real resource for people like myself, if I'm going to visit somebody, to be able to look through some of the notes and see what, what are significant things that have been going on since the last time I saw them? Yeah, that's right. And, and other visitors too. Right, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Um, so this is a, a, this is a great um, thing that we're having tonight, and thank you, Pastor mm -hmm. Ernest, for, for teaching this. Um, and truly, uh, we, we don't want you to make a decision tonight. We want you to really pray about this, because this is a very important part that you're already doing and a lot of people are doing it already but we just want to make sure that the right people are are in it <laughs> to be able to um, to uh, make a, a great impact um, in the congregation and those that are around as well right so yeah are we going to be made aware of any specific needs during the week that we might not know of before we see the bulletin on a weekend Hmm. We could be. <laughs> yeah, I think when, well, Laura's probably the first one that hears about stuff, or, or probably the pastors as well. So um, if you were on this committee, uh, then we would want to get that 
dealt with uh, quicker than, than not, mm -hmm. right? So yes, I would say yes, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, there's, there's usually a lot more going on than what you see in the bulletin because not yes. everybody wants the whole nine yards in the bulletin. <laughs> and some people don't want mm -hmm. that either, right? They don't want. Definitely oh, confidential. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. When uh, that happens. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because not everybody is uh, yeah. wanting everybody to know everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's where confidential mm -hmm. confidentiality is so important. Yes. On the other hand, we as staff and Melody would not try to send you into a situation where you should have known something that we knew that we, we wouldn't withhold that from you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, as you see, there needs to be a level of uh, trust and confidentiality and able to keep things under the lid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Let's stand and stretch for about three or four minutes. All right, well, let's uh, get underway again for part two and uh, you know, just more practical aspects of, to walk through here. And uh, again, feel free to take that home or uh, call me if you need a, a regular print size version. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go full hog and print, print one for you. Um, so some practical considerations, things to observe. The patient needs sensitivity, appropriateness, appropriate responses, and just to be heard and understood. Do you get a good picture for where they're at, what they're feeling uh, up or down, uh, what are their concerns? To communicate at whatever level they need. We are just talking in the break there. Uh, you don't have to try and fill the space. Sometimes it's just enough to sit there, and it's called ministry of presence, just to be there with the other person. Nothing wrong with that. Common patient fears. Death, results from a test, separation from people or things, unfinished business, monetary cares, Isolation, back to monetary cares. Again, maybe there's a place for a benevolent fund if you become aware of a particular need, let us know. Isolation, no one cares. The unknown, a lot of question marks when you have a medical procedure, so they're doing tests and it takes a while to get to the bottom of things. Pain, mutilation. Uh, my father-in-law just had uh, case of uh, necrotizing fasciitis and had his uh, left leg amputated. So that's things like that. That's the grief associated with that. Losing control. Now a helpful question might be, are you having any fears or anxiety about your condition? Many times people will say no, and maybe even if they do have it, they really want to tell you about it, but if they want to share, it gives them permission to encouragement to share what's the worst thing about this, uh, what are you most afraid of. Uh, and note mentally, for like, if you're going to be praying with them later, you might want to pray specifically about this. Temptations to avoid, set a program ahead of time. Well, I'm going to go talk about this and this and that, I'm going to ask about that, and then I'll say a prayer and be done. No, it's not that cut and dry. <laughs> Temptation to get rid of silence. You need to be comfortable with silence and patiently waiting for what their agenda is, not your agenda. Temptation to become the focus. Talk about myself because, oh, I know everything about myself and that's easy to share, so, well, let's fill the void with that. Mm -mm. Temptation to out-talk the patient. No, we need listeners. We started with that scripture from James, be quick to hear, slow to speak. To compare patients. <laughs> no, there's, there goes confidentiality right out the window there. You're just going to start talking about uh, patient B to patient A. <laughs> to provide solutions. Hey, guys here, you, you like to fix things? Yeah, we like to say, well, maybe you should try this medication or try that approach, but no, that's not your role there. Uh, let the medical staff do their work. They're the professionals. You don't try to fix them. 
This is uh, celebrate recovery tomorrow night. And one of the things is where we can't fix each other. We kind of have to deal with our own stuff. So uh, don't try and provide a solution. Temptation to organize the patient. <laughs> I'll get your life in order for you in three steps. Flat. <laughs> to take over the roles of the relatives. You know, let the, let the family members do their part and don't try and uh, mm -hmm. uh, side cut them. To become the defender and champion of the patient against staff. Some of you have been medical staff and you kind of uh, would probably understand why this is important not to have visitors kind of trying to um, be the advocate when the staff know probably a hundred times more what's going on with the patient really than you do. So don't uh, get in a, a three-way fight with the staff. More temptations to avoid, to disseminate knowledge, to assume the sole pastoral role, don't try and hog it to yourself, you're part of a team, like there's not only the pastoral staff from church, often in a hospital setting there's a chaplain at the hospitals so or networking with them as well. Uh, temptation to expect a patient's outpourings. Maybe the patient doesn't want to open up to you just yet, they're just still getting comfortable with you. A temptation to concentrate on something else. Uh, to stay too long. We talked about the, the ten minutes seemed to be pretty good, but the hour and a half ones, well, they were just plain tiring. Uh, temptation to be the evangelist. Now, as I'm borrowing this from uh, another website, so I put a little question mark here. When do you become the evangelist? Like, what, what are the openings? We are an evangelical missionary church, so we bear that name, but when it is, a, is it appropriate to share the gospel? If they're actively seeking, you can... You, you can hmm? <laughs> when they're just about dead. <laughs> well, yes, are, are, you, uh, uh, are you feeling your affairs are in order? Are you, you, you ready when the final time comes? Are you ready for that? that sort of question and if they say oh yeah I've lived a good life and I don't need anything more well that kind of shuts the door on the way but um, mm -hmm. if they're actively seeking and seem a little hesitant or be doubting in their faith you can ask well can, can I pray with you or, or do you have assurance of your salvation I could run through there's a couple of scriptures that talk about assurance of salvation and, 1 John 5, you could walk through that with them if they're open to it. But again, it's with their consent. You don't barge in there and be annoying if they've got resistance and a wall up. And it's for prayer. To be a temptation to be unnatural. Be yourself. You're no good at trying to be anybody else. Don't be faking it. Uh, be genuine. Temptation to coerce the patient into making a decision. They're not there to try and force them to decide a certain way, or they should do this or that. You, you, you can probably explore some options with them, like do some brainstorming or that, if they're, if they, they're looking for trying to figure things out in a certain direction, but don't be pushing them one way. And a temptation to hide behind the scriptures. You know, it's a good thing to share Bible verses and a passage in that, but they also want to uh, hear from you, like you as a person, not just God's word in, in the paper. Now, a, a practical list of guidelines. Uh, when you visit someone in a hospital, always call the hospital before you visit to ensure they're still admitted and have not been discharged. Sometimes you you find that you, you travel half an hour to get there and, oh, they left this morning. Oh, well. Um, choose a time during the day to visit unless you have been called by a family in crisis. Um, so try and find it. And often in hospitals, uh, at Wingham, the doctors tended to make their rounds in the morning. And so uh, the afternoon was a better time for visiting than morning when and, and they were having their physiotherapy and all that sort of thing. If necessary, and if others are around, it's acceptable for one to visit a patient of opposite gender. Uh, however, always best to visit in unrelated pairs. 
guards both the visitor and the recipient from abuse or false allegations. It's a little different in a hospital situation where there's staff around and passing the door and that sort of thing. It's kind of like having the hall monitors here in Sunday school, that there's, there's that extra degree <coughs> of, of monitoring and uh, accessibility. But uh, in, in, your own, in a person's home, we would not send a, a male to visit a female in her own home sort of thing. If you should have at least two people and preferably unrelated. This gets a little dicey when you got couples that want to go visiting. And Melody and I already had this little discussion while well, we set that up. And probably for people that are not uh, kind of the most vulnerable or in a weakened state or whatever, we would say, yes, it's okay for a couple to go and visit so and so. Uh, plan to protect. Um, and Robertson Hall, which is our insurance provider, would not recommend that because mm -hmm. if it come, if there is a false allegation that arises, then you go to court. The the spouse cannot testify on the other spouse's behalf, so you have no witness value from your spouse. Whereas if it's two unrelated people, that second person is your safeguard because they were there and they can testify that no such and such did not happen. Also, it, it, it uh, guards, in the case of a soul visitor, it guards you from temptation. I've been in situations where the, the, the person I was visiting was a little bit uh, frisky, shall we say, and that's not a good place to be either, so uh, it's good to have two people there. Oh, yes, Peter? Um, just, just quickly, the, 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 it says two unrelated, visit in unrelated pairs. I'm unclear. Does, does would the unrelated pairs still have to be one of each gender? Not necessarily, but it, it's preferable. It's a female that you don't just send two males. Yeah, exactly. that's what I was thinking. Yeah, but it's it's better to have at least a male and a female in that case. If it's a man and two women go visiting, that's probably not so loaded a situation. It's probably still preferable to have a man and a woman in yeah. that case. But, okay. Yeah, practically speaking, for a rural country church like we are, it makes sense to have couples go if, if they're both on the team, sort of thing. Um, and it's kind of it's a it's a level of risk. And are we willing to take that level of risk? Yes, in some situations, and it makes sense. What about these uh, unattached together? There's people of the opposite sex that are driving there now. They're in there and they. Tenuous situation as well. Uh, sorry, if the people well, this, living common law sort of thing. You no, mean? no, this man and woman who are not a couple go driving off to Stratford to visit. Yeah. And now they're in the same situation as you're putting the exactly. In the so it's uh, yeah. what should happen according to Plan Protect is probably not and, and ethically is not to have them driving together. Both drive. <laughs> You're exactly right. Yeah. Um, Billy Graham, uh, you know, Billy Graham's record was kind of state spotless and he, it was kind of marvelous for a, an evangelist, a big popularity. But Billy Graham, if he was going in an elevator and he was by himself in the elevator and a woman got on at a certain floor, Billy would step off the elevator and take another elevator. Because so he would not be alone in the elevator with a woman. So just that's kind of the degree of uh, purity that kind of got him through his career. And you've got to admire that. Yeah. Oh, uh, pray before leaving the car, or entering the room, that the Lord will give you the right words of encouragement to minister to the patient. Have that listening ear to God as well, depending on the spirit. And use the hand sanitizer outside the door before and after. Uh, you're, uh, the hospital is a war zone against germs. So when you, you be, beside each door, or just inside the door, one or the other, you will see a hand sanitizer. So just make it automatic routine. When you go into the room, and sanitize your hands, visit the patient. When you're coming out of the room, sanitize your hands. Because you may be going to another person who is MRSA positive or something and like, you don't want to be spreading germs from room to room or taking them home or to your next shopping experience. So just use the sanitizers. 
If patient's out of view, ask a nurse to enter the room prior to you to ensure the patient is ready to receive your visit, especially if they got a screen across. You don't want to just barge in if they get half dressed or finishing on the bedpan. So it's best to check with the nurse if can Mrs. So-and-so receive a visitor now. And just if they're not, then just wait out in the hall for a few minutes until they are ready. Marilyn, you've got lots of experience that way. Please chip in if you're thinking of other things to add here. Uh, not before entering the room, introduce yourself as visiting on behalf of Aaron Chapel. Probably most of the people you visit will know you already with this size of church. Uh, but if you don't know them, just introduce yourself and say who you're with. It. That's part of who you're representing. You're not just there on your own to, as yourself. You're also on the church's behalf as well. Do not interrupt doctors or staff who are treating the patient. Simply leave and return at another time or wait outside the door until the staff have left. They're in the hospital to get treatment and let that be the priority. We can kind of wait. Never wake up a patient. If a relative is there, you can address them or offer to talk with them outside the door. Sometimes I, I check with the staff, and if the patient's kind of been sleeping all day, the staff will say, sure, it's, good. it's okay, go ahead and wake them up. But generally, you know, they may need to be sleeping. So if the patient's alone and asleep, simply leave on their bedside table a church bulletin, or if you took, it doesn't hurt to take two or three bulletins each week if you've got some left over. Or just a note that you're praying for them. Be sure you do pray for them afterward in your quiet time. If the patient's awake and alert, speak clearly and positively, avoiding probing questions. Uh, respect, again, their privacy. Don't push. Listen. If they offer information about their condition, hold this information as confidential, only providing necessary information to the church pastor. It's usually good to ask, is it okay if I pass this along to our caring coordinator, Melody, and the pastoral staff. And they say, may, may, may say no, and that's okay. We'll respect that. Never say, I know what you're going through, because <laughs> you really don't. That can put up a wall right there. How can you know what I'm going through? Talk in a volume that's respectful of them and their semi-private neighbor on the other side of the curtain. There should be no loud talking or raucous laughter. Don't be annoying the rest of the ward. Um, however, since laughter is good medicine, it would be appropriate to keep your conversation light and positive. That doesn't mean you don't get into serious topics, but try and keep it uplifting overall. Watch your time. Don't outstay your welcome. Usually 15 minutes or less. Unless you're sitting to give a family member a break. That's a little different if you're uh, being respite for a family member. So you go out and do some shopping or whatever. Give the patient the opportunity to fall asleep as you sit quietly if that's the case. You don't have to keep them awake and talk. Do not presume to turn the television on unless they ask. Um, this is another thing often visiting in people's homes, the television will be on. And I find it very annoying. Sometimes I sit with my back kind of to the TV so it doesn't bother me. Uh, sometimes, depending on how well I know the person, I'd ask, is it okay if we turn the TV down? Um, so just sometimes you just got to compete. TV's on, that's their choice, but keep your focus on them. It's okay to ask the TV to turn down so you can talk more easily. Do not sit on the bed. It's their own limited private space. If you're not in their home, if they're in the hospital, and that's all the turf they've got, don't be intruding. And also, especially if they've been abused before, that could be super triggering if they start getting onto the bed. Ask if it's all right for you to share a scripture reading, as the Lord leads. Um, when I was chaplain at Wingham Hospital, there were about four or five uh, psalm passages that I had little sticky notes up at the top of the page that I could flip to fairly easily that were suited to a hospital setting or prayers for health and so on. Uh, psalm 103 was one of my favorites and some there's some in the 90s as well. But, uh, it's good to have two or three of those kind of ready uh, in that sort of a situation. But you know, if you've been having something in your quiet time and the Lord needs you to share it, go for it be stuck in certain passages. And pray with the patient before you leave the room. 
if it's okay with them. You know, it would be all right if I pray for you. Your family's present. Remember them in your prayer as well. You can kind of strengthen the spouse or whatever. Oftentimes it's a sweet thing to all hold hands around the patient, depending on how many are there and if the opportunity is there. Also, if it's kind of near like a deathbed situation or that, that can be really comforting to the family to be kind of committing the patient into God's care. It's okay to hold their hand or touch their arm or shoulder as you pray. I'd recommend that if, if they're open to that. That's just pretty powerful. You did clean your hands before entering the room, right? Mm -hmm. If not, excuse yourself to wash or sanitize your hands before you hold your hand in prayer. It should be just automatic when you enter the room, sanitize your hands. Intensive care visits. Be aware of the hours of visitation before you go. Like in ICU can be different hours than the rest of the hospital. Be aware of the contact precaution signage at the doors. Gowns, mask, gloves, uh, whatever it's at. It depends on what the um, bug is, how much you need to gown up. Sometimes it's just gown and gloves. Sometimes you've got to put on a mask on it as well if it's respiratory um, droplets and that sort of thing. And follow the hospital instructions. Dispose of these items in the designated places. So if that's if it's contact precautions, you go into the, well, there'll be stuff in the hallway usually for the gown and gloves and so on. You go into the room, well, you sanitize your hands, you put on the gown and the gloves, you go into the room, have your visit. Before you leave, there will be a garbage can before the door where you take your stuff off and put them in the garbage can and then sanitize your hands and out the room. As I say, it's a uh, war zone as far as germs go. Keep visits very brief. Acknowledge family who are present. Leave a bulletin note card if you have one in case the patient's asleep. Okay. Do not take, we were talking about flowers and gifts uh, a bit at the break. Do not take flowers or gifts while the patient is in ICU. Flowers eat up oxygen and gifts often get lost, especially when the patients move to another room or stolen. Things walk off too. It's just, it just can be another fiddle for the family to try and move and find. No gifts, please, but instead you might offer to sit with patient while family goes to the hospital cafe for a meal. Just out for a break if they need a break. Offer to assist with needs before leaving the hospital room if you can follow through. Offer to sit with the patient who's bed bound, read a book, scripture. Uh, offer to run an errand, such as grocery store or pharmacy, for the family. Is there anyone you'd like me to call to let them know you're in? Sometimes just communication, that's a service you can provide. Remember, you're representing Christ and his church here in chapel when you visit. So it's an honor and privilege to make this visit, not a burden. Some resources, so if you want to... Uh, Find out a bit more, call Laura at the church office, say you're, you're preparing to make hospital visits, ask who's in the hospital and where, or maybe Melody has contacted you and here's, here's two or three people, uh, depending on which way it goes. But often people will call Laura during the week and say so-and-so's in the hospital. So she uh, kind of got her finger on that pulse. Uh, so Melody may be contacting you. If it, it's probably more long-term if it's Melody. Um, keep track of visits to shut-ins by using the, the folder. And the, we're, we're thinking maybe the second office area there for that. We haven't really settled down on that. But the idea, the tellers are always in the first office after the service. And if you're wanting to check the folder, uh, we should have it in a different room than the, the main office area where the tellers are counting money. So that's what we're thinking right now. It should be a place that's not very widely accessible because it is fairly confidential stuff going to be in that folder too. Um, and I would recommend you watch the Plan to Protect webinar, Hospital and Home Visits, and I can send you the link and you can watch it uh, at home. Um, it's very good. It's about 40 minutes, so it was a bit too long to kind of work into this presentation, but it uh, has some really good uh, points from, uh, from the risk management point of view. As I say, they probably go further than we feel it's practical to go, um, but it kind of makes you aware of, of the different dynamics involved here. 
uh, for further reading that booklet that you've got in front of you there from New Minus uh, Baptist Church. And uh, especially pages 10 to 20, the first half is kind of more theoretical than that, but the last uh, 10 pages or so will cover a lot of the practical things we've been talking about. So uh, well, I have. What are we missing, Melody, or any questions that people have, too? Um, I guess it's just uh, implementing it and when, mm -hmm. um, which we'll be mm -hmm. looking at in the very mm -hmm. near future, very near future. Mm -hmm. But just um, after this, like I, mean, like I said, go home, pray about it, think about it. Um, are you willing to do two visits a month? Um, at least, probably, around two, I would think, um, depending on how many people. Um, and then let me know as soon as you can so that I can get you on our list and um, get things implemented and, uh, and working. <laughs> That, uh, two visits would be desirable. If you could only do one visit a month, that would still be a help to the church. So just let us know. If you, some of you may want to do three or something like that. That's fine too. We're thinking kind of like a three-month probationary period, seeing how it goes with the, first of all, this system of making notes and that, but also just making sure people are suited to be visitors. I'm pretty sure you all are, but uh, you know, we, we had to throw it. We wanted to throw it out to the whole congregation, but not everybody in the whole congregation is cut out for visiting ministry. So that's why we should have a three-month a three month period or something and let you do a couple of visits, see how it goes and that sort of thing. I hope I don't have to come and say, it doesn't seem like you're really cut out for this ministry. <laughs> Would you consider this over here? We do need, we do need uh, ushers and we do need tellers and there's a bunch of other ministries we can steer you to as well. So. <laughs> but uh, I, I really appreciate your interest in this ministry, and I know many of you are doing it already and, and are very good at it. John? There was uh, two things. One, uh, was there some mention of the police check and the update and so on? Mm -hmm. Especially because there's vulnerable people involved, there should right. be, you should have a police check. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like how long ago? Four years, I think, is uh, when they recommend getting a renewed police check. And, and there's no cost if you're a volunteer uh, for a church. It's, there's no cost to getting the police check. So uh, it's not and, a, a And problem. is this, uh, this the, the presentation, is that somewhere that we can take with us? Can I email it to you or print sure. it and put it in your mailbox, one or the other? You can email. Okay, yeah. Just uh, uh, make sure you let me know and in a place where I can write it down and I'll get it to you. Okay. Yeah. John, uh, Jim. Jim, 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 that was John. Yeah. Is there going? To, are you going to break us into areas, like so that we're not? It's not the wrong with overlapping, but there could be people in our area that mm -hmm. you know geographically somebody, would make sense in a way. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody's sick in another area, somebody mm -hmm. can't go. Yeah. You know, yeah. there is people that can go. Bear that in mind. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, I've been thinking about that too because when. Yeah, I used to do it with the elders. I used to do it kind of geographically, the congregation to where they were mm -hmm. located so that they could cover those people a little easier than not. So, um, yeah, I was thinking that as well. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking if somebody in our area is sick, yeah. that yeah. we know nothing about when you come to church on Sunday and it's in the boat, and, yeah. um, we should have known. Yeah. 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 Well, as long as the communication lines are open, we're good. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, sometimes it's not going to be a perfect world, obviously, right? Like, yes, some people just, just won't yeah. say anything, and, uh, and it's not Laura's fault or it's not my fault. It's just, you know, it's we want to make sure that things are looked after as early as we can. Sure. Just found out yesterday, person X had a uh, knee replacement October 8th, and I never realized that they'd had it. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> things, things like that you like knowing about. Yeah. So is this basically just people that belong to our church then? Largely, yeah. yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And not, uh, no. What you're talking about, hospital? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and I'm kind of blending a little bit with being the chaplain uh, where I didn't know everybody before I went to see them, so that's a little different situation. But, but there may be people going to the church that you don't know or right. people on the fringe or associated with somebody that goes to the church that mm. you don't know already. 
largely you'll probably know the people already. And uh, I think in the file, I think uh, at the front we hope to have one page that lists all the people to be visited. And if you see somebody missing from that sheet, please let me know. We, we generate that from our church database based on, as Melody was saying, I think this list that I ran off is 65 and older. Um, but some people, we don't know their age. And so if I don't know their age, they don't show up on that listing. So we can add people to make sure we're not, help us make sure we're not missing somebody. How do we, or we, or you, know these people would like to visit? I think in particular, say Georgie mm -hmm. Corbett, she would never ask for a visit, and yet uh, she certainly enjoys a little bit of laughter when you go there. Mm -hmm. Generally, we'll probably already know from the staff having contacted her, having been there, and. Okay. and, and uh, between, between Laura and Melody and myself, we'll probably be in touch with them saying, would you like a, a visit from a Caring Connecting volunteer? Okay. I think that's reasonable for us to, to do mm -hmm. at least that step. Yeah. So yes, if you ever yeah. just decide, oh, we're going to we'll go look at the file and see who needs a visit and go do that? Or is it going to be more organized? Well, hopefully it's going to be more organized than that. Mm -hmm. um, like I would like to go monthly um, for the ones that we know about that you know are whatever. Um, there's going to be ones that are going to be interspersed in there if they come ill or in the hospital or during that month. I kind of like to go on a month-to-month -month basis anyway to get people covered um, in a regular way. Yeah. And with the Alvanto, we can run off uh, listing as often as we like of once the dates are in, if you're writing on your notes and uh, the date you visited and the melody is inputting that into the directory, then when we print off a list, we can have the, the, the most recent ones down at the bottom and the ones that have been longest at the top. So you'll know who who is coming up, who's due for a visit if you want to think about it that way. At the start, pretty much everybody will be due for a visit, but as, as this gets into operation, you'll see that, oh, so-and-so was visited a month ago or something, and well, let's do so and so over here. That's been three months since they had something. Hmm. And, and if the Lord leads you to go see so and so, like, <laughs> do it. Listen to the Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. But, exactly. but, but but please write it in the sheet, and then we know mm -hmm. that they've had a visit. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, drop in spontaneous visits are aren't recommended. No, it's better to call ahead at least to the person, and uh, it's it's better still if you don't mind looking at the sheet to see when they had a visit. To, uh, see, but but for people that are shut-ins, um, unless they're getting two visitors the same day, it's probably not too serious a problem. So it's been a day or two. Uh, I would suggest that it depends how well you know them. Maybe you're. We're all pretty busy in them once a week, and you, you kind of continue doing that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And if they're expecting that and enjoying it, go go to it. I think of Marilyn's mom. She gets lots of visitors, and nobody's going to write that down. We just go PRN, right, Devin? <laughs> 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 Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight and for your time. And I, I'm just really encouraged to see the number that were signing up for this and interested in it. And I'm really thankful um, for the ministry that's going to go on in our church body as a result. And it's not that we're trying to let the pastoral staff off the hook, far from it. I, I hope it will get us more on the hook where we're most needed. But there's a lot of routine visitation that can be done that was getting missed otherwise. So this will be a big help. Um, Boris, you mind closing in prayer for us? Yeah. Lord, we thank you again for this time we can be together and learn some new uh, ways to reach other people, Lord. We thank you for um, Pastor Ernest and Melody and Laura and all those who are um, already doing this ministry. We ask your blessing on each one. We pray that this will be a successful um, Lord, that 
people will be reached that haven't been reached, and um, that your name will be glorified <coughs> through this ministry, Lord. Mm -hmm. and pray for safety as people travel, um, visiting, and just on their way home tonight. This guide and protect, we pray. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. One thing I did forget to mention was once this gets rolling, uh, another phase that we talked about is the committee could be rolled out to newcomers and to things like um, uh, VBS, the parents of when they're bringing kids to VBS or parents dropping kids off for Sunday school, just to have a good, a two or three people around that to <coughs> engage the parents and be talking to them. And, just uh, that's the broader picture of caring and connecting beyond this kind of initial group. So, uh, and there are some people again that are already doing that, inviting families into their home for a meal after church and that sort of thing. So that's just another aspect of the hospitality side we didn't get into tonight, but that's kind of in the back of our minds when things get rolling. Lord bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you.